that. Welcome to another Up Close and Personal. And this time I have the honor of interviewing Mr. Phil Margo, the lead, one of the original tokens. If the lion sleeps tonight, is probably their best known song. Yes. And Maxine Margo. Maxine. Maxine Margo my Rubin. My kid sister memes, Maxine. Hi, big bro, Mudge. Who's a radio person in her own right. And, and, she, and, I, and I, by the way, just not, not to avoid a little confusion, I do a show with Phil called The Lion Roars, which we talk about politics. I do a show with Maxine, which we talk about the environmental problems and what we could do. But this show is a celebration. It's a celebration. Again, it's up close and personal. And uh, we, we're talking about Whoa. Phil Margo, the entertainer, not the politician. And we have uh, is Maxine he, Margo. Is he, he stop, Max? Is he I'm moving? here, but he. It's what? Are you, uh, you, you froze. Uh, something wrong with your thing. Are you okay? Are you on there? Yeah, no. We're, yeah, it just says the internet connection is unstable because everybody's using it. Yeah, well, it is. Uh, well, it's all we got, folks. I know, but uh, f yeah. for me, it's okay. Hey, listen, yeah, I listen to uh, you know CNN or MSNBC or Fox, and they're always being frozen. So, no, you're you're really going in and out, though. My voice or the picture? Everything. The picture, the picture stops, and then we don't hear you. We might have to redo this. I think. No, I, I actually on my end is fine. We see what we see on my end. <laughs> okay, fine. So well, I, anyway, Phil, you go yes. way back into the rock and roll world at the at the beginnings. Tell us well, about not what, at the beginning, not the beginning, beginning, but in the in the early, in the beginning of the '60s. Certainly, the '60s were the most important segment of the record industry's history, because in 1961, when we were nominated for a Grammy. It was held in a hotel in Nashville, and we weren't invited. <laughs> oh God! And it wasn't televised, and and then, and, and of course, ten years later, it was a big deal. But in those ten years, we were part of the core of people who built the record industry. By 1970, we were the second most successful producers, gross-wise, money-wise, in the industry. So we had a, we you know. God knows what we would have accomplished if we didn't fall apart like we did. But you know what the hell? I got well, a chance well, to do other things. Well, I, re I remember. I don't know what year it was, but the Grammy Awards basically were given to, you know, the uh, you know the, the Frank Sinatra type of music and uh, Pat Boone and uh, you know it was more or less crooners no, and individual we would singers. The well, Lion Seeps tonight was beaten out by Chubby Checker. The twist. Right, right, right. Well, I remember. I, when yeah, the but, but record of the year was the twist because RCA did nothing to promote it. We didn't even know we were nominated until it was over. Wow. But, I mean, RCA, that's why they call it the Record Cemetery of America. <laughs> yeah. Well. But, but, but I, I remember uh, Dick Clark started uh, the American Music Award because. None of the rock groups would get were nominated for Grammys. Right, they were. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. It's all. It's all. It's all, poli it's all political. It's all political. It's all political. It's everything. Everything is. You know. Anyway, but but. Okay, going so back. Anyway, how, how did they start in the music business? Well, I I I am a uniquely untalented person. I mean, I oh, have I'm a talent. Good. I have a talent, but most people, when they find their talent, they explore it, they delve into it. They, they, you know, I watch my my grandkids. You know, my my grandson Ethan just got. He's still in college, and he got a very wonderful job teaching music because he delved deep into it. He sight sings, he sight reads, he he plays five or six instruments. You know. I didn't have I didn't have that curiosity. I did things as they came, and 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 I, I decided I made the decision that I wanted to have a work in, in when I graduated high school. I wanted to work in the Catskill Mountains as a musician. It was a goal. It was just a goal. I never expected to get there, but I did things to move myself along. 
you know, I taught myself the piano because the teachers couldn't teach me quick enough to make that make that date. And I taught myself a method of piano, which they teach now today, which didn't exist back then. And and I got myself up to the point where I had a little band and then we, we do little uh, uh, sweet 16s and little local parties, you know. And from there we worked in the Catskills and from the Catskills I got back and that led to something else. And I wound up making a demo and, 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 and I just did things as they came to me. I didn't, you know, some people are dedicated to what they do and they, they make their life's work out of it, being a doctor, being an attorney, being a scientist, all of those, all of those areas of life where you really have to know in, deep down into the well of the of the whatever form it is. I didn't. I still can't sight sing music, sight read music. I never, you know, know once you I know something? You just mentioned doctor, uh, attorney, and scientists. But the most joy in the world is music. It gives people joy. The other things give people other things. But without music, without music, I don't think I could not have gotten through this year without music. Well, and I don't think anybody I know in my personal life would have gotten through this insane year without being able to listen to the Tokens or the Beatles or, you know, Michael Kiwanuka, who's a new guy and, and some amazing new artists that are out too. And, and also my great nephew Solomon. And, and Ethan, I mean, it's, you know, they're creating things that give people joy. So to me, in this time of supposed to be comfort and joy, what you have done and contributed in my book is, uh, no matter how you did it, is amazing to me. I, 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 first of all, first of all, it is my firm and deep belief that during the period of the 60s, and the, the six, especially the 60s, Music was not only a joy to the ear, but it was our conscience. Right, message. Our un, unrealized conscience. It sat on our shoulder or in our ear, and it told us, take care of each other. You know, everybody love one another. Um, um, anti-war, anti-racial prejudice, you know, uh, you know, all of those things, uh, Ebony and Ivory, all of those songs that were, were, were you know, um, um, where have all the flowers gone? All of those songs were our conscience. They sat on our shoulder and they told us, behave, okay, behave. Well, then then it, the record industry, got into rap and stuff and it was all about complaining and not and and, it, and a lot of it had 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 depth to it it had meaning to it they, they were complaining about the right things but it was not it was it was to the wrong audience and it wasn't it was to the audience who already knew what was going wrong yeah well uh, Phil nobody there's no, there's no there's no music around that's general because everybody can listen to what they want they they pick it up on the on the computer but back in the 60s there was a top 40 all kinds of music got played we were on the same chart with frank sinatra and to perry como and all those artists we were on the charts too now it's all divided yeah and it doesn't have the same impact because now kids search for the music that they want to hear rather than hear the music that they should hear Okay, I guess is what I'm saying. I think that's succinct enough. I, I can't. Well, well the, there was. I remember the, the big difference going back to the '60s when you when you started. Uh, again, going back when I was uh, preteen, you know, the big music was like the Perry Como's uh, or Tony Bennett is still around, but it was all the crooners. It was all the uh, singers, and it was just exiting the big band era, which was a part of the '40s going into the Kroonis series and that King Coles, again, Tony Bennett, the, and then all of a sudden it became rock and roll. It became- oh, But it, it wasn't all of a sudden. It, it, was, it was right there in the fifties, the black groups, the, the black R and B we, we, the, 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 the groups, all those songs were in 55, 54. Those first records, uh, Little, Little Richard and, and those guys and, and Fats Domino. But really, if you go back, you could hear it in the 20s with Louis Armstrong 
and the East Side Blues. I mean, that was the kind of, that was the father to Chuck Berry and Hunter, you know, and, and then it became rock and roll and groups, backgrounds, which the, the preceding was the Mills Brothers, you know, there were groups like that in the 40s that had started. The only difference was the feel, the heavier feel, you know, and, uh, you know, but, but, and so well, it really started back further back than you think it did. Well, well you, you're, you're more into music than, than I was, but getting back to your career, after you left the Catskills, yeah, would you play the piano, did you say? Yeah, I, I learned how to play the piano and when I worked in the Catskills for the summer and when I got back, um, my drummer's father won the lottery. So we needed to get a new drummer. So the new drummer knew this guy, Hank Medress, and he introduced Hank to me and, 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 and we did a demo of Chopsticks. We had a rock and roll version of Chopsticks. I wish I had it here to play, but uh, that got lost in, the, in, in history. But, um, and nobody was interested in it. And Hank casually asked me if I ever wrote before. You know, and I said, no, we never did. Yeah, I never tried it. I never thought about writing, you know. So we started writing. We got together and started writing. Me, Hank, and Mitch, who was, who was like about, well, 61. So it was about 14, 15 at the time. And um, again, um, Mitch is your younger brother, right? Yeah. And, uh, and um, we lost him a couple of, three years ago with Thanksgiving. Um, and it really left a, a very a heavy hole in my heart because I don't look at music the same way anymore. You know, I can't, I don't, I can't drive, I, I don't, I haven't written anything. I, I can't sit down at the piano. I can't even look at the piano, you know, it's like really hard. But, and I really miss standing on stage and do and talking to the audience and entertaining them, which is something I probably will never do again. So it's kind of sad, but, um, but anyway, we wrote a couple of songs and some people were interested and we, and well, first of all, we made a demo and, and Hank was on the train and uh, the, the Brighton Express going from Manhattan to Brooklyn, Brighton Beach. And uh, there was a woman on the train and he was, Hank was holding a demo and the woman said, is that a demo? And Hank said, yes. And she introduced herself and her son was a producer. So that was, you know, with all the running around in the Brill building and knocking on doors, the beginning of our career was Hank met someone on the BMT. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth. That's the truth. That's the absolute truth. And, um, and that led to us recording our Tonight I Fell in Love, which led us to getting on RCA, which led to The Lion Sleeps Tonight, which led to producing, which led to a very successful decade of producing records. You can see they're all up on the wall. Wait, maybe I'll tilt it back and show you. Yeah. What, what other records did you produce? Well, the first record that we produced that was a hit was He's So Fine. Who sang and that? Then the Chiffons. Yeah. And then- He's so and, fine, do lang, do lang. Yeah. What we were doing, you know, it's, it didn't start that way. And we had we had blown our budget for producing, for, for having a, a, a hiring musicians uh, or an arranger at Capital when we were Capital producing, we blew our budget so we had no money left. So we had to play ourselves on He's So Fine, which which if we had a regular session with regular musicians, it wouldn't have been the record it turned out to be, not even close. I was playing drums and I didn't know, again, I, uh, here, here sticks, play the drums. Okay, so I'm playing the drums and I counted off and I played the first eight bars and then we, stop and, and 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 Judy says he's so fine do lang do so the engineer Johnny Cuculo stops the take he says hey guys that do lang thing is cute why don't you start with it so I just looked at the girls and said you got it as soon as I hit the drum you start okay fine ready one two three four bop do lang and that was the record you know and and we and we cut about three or four sides with them we, we went around to every record company, all the majors, and, and, and nobody was interested. We, everybody said, oh, I like the group, I don't like the song, I like the song, I don't like the group. How do you not like a song during the age of records being made for teenage girls Then He's So Fine? How do you not like that? I mean, it just, you know, so anyway, 
we kept going, we believed in it, and we finally sold it to Lori Records. When, when they heard it, they locked the door, wouldn't let us out of the office till we made a deal. And that wow. was the first hit. And then, and then after that was a hit, I got a call from Carol King. She said, I have a perfect follow-up. They were very, her and Jerry were very successful. Jerry, Jerry Goffin, who she wrote with at the time, were very successful in writing follow-ups. Like the, the Shirelles had two nights tonight, you know, say, you're going to meet me tonight. And, and they did, will you still love me tomorrow? Uh-huh. I mean, it was, it was a perfect, awesome. which is one of the most perfect songs ever written, by the way. It yeah, is such a perfect song. It just makes me cry every time I think of it. And well, then I, I, I love Carol King. Oh wait, Abby, Abby, you want to say hello? No, okay. Now tell I'm her it's Christmas. It. Come on, it's Christmas. Come on, it's Christmas. Who is that? It's it's it, I'm on the it's Maxine. It's, it's me. Maxine. Yeah, sit down. Maxine. Yeah, say hi. There it is. Oh, how cute. Hi, Ab. Where's your dog? My dog? You want to see my dog? Yeah. She's by her ball. She's by her balls right now. Hold on. Where's Come here, you. Let me see. This is our Christmas special. <laughs> oh, this is, see, I'm wearing my Christmas hat. Oh, there, oh there, my God. There, there she is. There's Sparkles. Wait. Oh, hi, sweetheart. Oh, look at that. Hi. Whoops. I can't pick her up, but oh, oh gosh, she's I can't big. believe how big she got. Hey, come here. She's she's, only... she's she's gonna be huge. She's already thirty something pounds, and she's gonna oh. be she's gonna be really really tall. You're gonna have to put her on a this diet. My, by the way, audience, this is my, my, my wife of, of, of fifty four years. Speak for you, go. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yay, there's Sparkle. Oh, so sweet. Oh, oh. baby. Oh, oh getting kisses. Getting kisses, kisses. Oh, yeah. look at that beauty. She's beautiful. Oh, she she's, really like, she's like a sexy dog. She's a sex. She's a diva. I'm, I'm a green a, diva, and she's a, a doggy diva. Hey, uh, everybody have a happy and healthy and safe holiday, but I have something in the oven. Oh, I'll come okay. back. I got chicken soup on the stove, so I got to check oh. it out. Okay, <laughs> you could have chicken soup and cookies, right? Okay. Now. Yeah, okay. All right, sweetie. Uh, I, I got tamales in the oven. Okay. Do we oh, have- really? Oh, now we're talking. Now you're my new best friend. Is oh, that my- sounds good. Roxy, my wife. Between, uh, her, between her and her mother, they're, 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 you know, they're originally from El Salvador. Yeah, anyway, anyway. Well, yes, but now Maxine was there during all this time. Okay, this is true. So she, she might have a perspective on it too. So I'm going to stop here at, at at one fine. Oh, Carol King called me up and she said I have a follow up for the chiffons. Uh, that's where I left off before, and she sent me over the demo she did with Little Eva, right, on one right. fine day, and I said I'll do it. I want the track. And, and she gave me the track and I used, that's her playing the piano on one fine day. And we added a bass and a saxophone solo and I added the shooby doo wah was and we had another hit in five seconds. I, 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 adjust adjust your camera a little bit. It was like a walk. It was like, you know, there were only, there were only three records of all the hits that, I, that we did and all the chart records that we did that I was sure of. One fine day, knock three times, and I got rhythm by the happenings. I was positive they would be smashes. You, you, weren't, you, of, you weren't positive of uh, The Lion Sleeps Tonight? No. Because no. that's, that's your signature songs. No, well, we loved it. We, lo- we thought it was great work. We appreciated what we did, it, but f- we didn't think it- we, we didn't think it was it was commercial because f- there f- was no f- record f- of that. Yeah. Phil, adjust your and, camera a little bit. Uh, adjust the angle. You have too much headroom. Me? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um. I. I. You know. I didn't. We. We. We didn't believe that it could be a hit, and neither did RCA ultimately, because they went out on the other side. They. They were. They were promoting the other side. It was only the luck of Dick Smith, a disc jocker on WORC in Worc- Worcester, Massachusetts, that. Um. That turned it over and played Lion Seeps tonight. And the minute he played it, his phones lit up. And 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 Boston ordered 10,000 records off that one station. Wow. You know, and then by the, at that point, everybody knew and they turned it over and it was a smash. 
but we loved the record. We just, we thought we did something really interesting, but, but you know, that, that, that came from our hearts. I mean, we did a demo of it, which we gave RCA, which is why they signed us, you know, and, and the arrangement was pretty similar to the demo, but of course, Sammy Lowe took it three steps higher with the, with the soprano, you know, I mean, it was just, it was, it was, it was a miracle, you know, and, 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 and again, I sang Wimbleways. Right. You know? I mean, I mean, really, I mean, I, and, and, and with all of that, and having a hit record as an artist, you'd think I'd really work on my instrument and learn how to sing properly. Uh, properly. I didn't. I never took vocal lessons. You know, that's what I mean about not diving deep into my, into my ability. You know, people <laughs> generally find something and, and dedicate their lives to it. I couldn't do that. And I, and I know I couldn't because of how I scattered around. Like when I came, all of a sudden one day I was a manager and I was writing for television shows. I don't know how that happened. I was, I was here, <laughs> I, had a, I had an idea for a show. I spoke to the guy at ABC and, and he said, uh, you know, okay. And they had two scripts written and they both stunk and they were about to kill the project. And, and my part, the guy I was writing with it said, look, give us a chance to write do the story. And if you like the story, go to script, pay us minimum and only pay us full boat if it goes to, if it goes to uh, film. Yeah. And that's how this wife for hire got made. And so then all of a sudden I was doing, making movies for television. Was, was, that Freddie, was that Freddie Silverman back then? No, that was at ABC. ABC. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, ABC was this wife, this wife for hire. No, but we, but I, 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 I wrote a, a Gary Coleman movie. I produced three Gary Coleman movies. I wrote a couple of different Strokes episodes. You know, I don't know how. I never studied writing. And you know, the, the, the sitcom business was, you know, you write a script and then the, the staff changes it. You know, they, they rewrite everything. They just take the basic, you know, the only one I think that didn't have to, didn't ever do that was Larry, Larry Gelbart. Larry Gelbart would write a mesh script overnight right. and they would, It'd be on the table in the morning rehearsing. That's how, that's, that's a writer. You know, the guy was a genius. I mean, Aaron Sorkin, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm like, ah, sir, you know, I, well, I'm, I'm, I, I look back at my life and I say, you know, the most amazing things that I did was my getting, staying married for 54 years and my grandchildren and children, you know, that I, I mean, you know, that I had direct. Barrier part. <laughs> You have you, you had a direct effect on, huh? Right. I mean that that's I mean that's the best thing I ever. All that other stuff. I'm glad they make me makes people happy. Is that my telephone phone? ringing? Oh jeez. Well. Bye, Phil. And bye, Phil. <laughs> and remember, Maxine. During that period, during that period, you were a cheerleader. I was uh like. It's six, West. I what? It's right, I'm, on, I'm on the here with, with 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 Maxine, so I can't talk to you. Oh, I didn't know you were the winter. Bye. <laughs> Hang up. <laughs> that was my brother-in-law. He I always calls up. He knows when time. to call. I'll tell you. Does he call all the wrong time? Always calls the wrong time. <laughs> he, he always calls. I told him. I didn't tell him I was with you. That was the problem on Zoom just now. Oh, okay. Um, but oh, anyway, okay. he's. Yeah, anyway, anyway, so so. I mean, I'm, I'm truly an overachieving underachiever, I think, is what I am. I don't That's know. what I am. I, I, I could really, because I never loved anything that I did to go deep in it. That's all. I mean, except now I feel bad about not getting more involved, not learning how to sing better. I think that's the only regret I have. It. Not learn, not not learning how to sing better because I didn't have to. All I had to do was go whim away or you know dippity do da no, whatever. You sang some, you have... sang some parts on different albums. I mean, you know, my favorite. I mean, I love the tokens, and you know, when the lion hit number one, I just remember literally jumping on the bed in the living room or the couch, whatever, for at least five to ten minutes without stopping. But I didn't even know what the hell that all meant. You know, I know that my brothers were touring around the world and I was like, okay, you, you, <laughs> it's like, and all I know is 
I was the token si token sister until I hit high school. You and were then seven. I was seven. <laughs> you were seven when we had the record. You were. Yeah, you I was were... like six or something. Yeah, I, I didn't know what what the hell do I know? You know, so it was like exciting. I mean, none of my friends would come to our house because we were so far from Leave It to Beaver right. or the Cleavers. You know, we were like, holy shit, your house is <laughs> crazy. Yeah. We don't have anything like that. We're like Ozzy and Harriet we visited or, or you know, uh, it, it was just a whole different mindset. And, you know, my friends, I could have charged money, you know, because Mitch, Mitch's little cave downstairs, talk about a man cave in, in, the, in the house. I mean, I could have charged admission because he had like the lava lamp and the fish tank and he had a million albums. So when you guys were away, I would go down with some friends who <laughs> listened to all the records. He had every Beatle album you can imagine and all, and you know, all the other yeah. albums, but it was, it was pretty, um, it was exciting and a little weird, you know, to have your brothers I, go all I, over the place. I didn't, it, I mean, I, I, I took the subway into the city a lot. I walked up Brighton First Street to get to our house on Ocean Parkway. And, you know, this was during while we were having these records. And we would take the subway in because we couldn't afford to bring our cars into the city at that point. You know, we, 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 we barely had it. You know, we had hit records and I fell in love. It didn't pay that much. And, but I would walk up the street and I remember on Brighton First Street, we, were, we grew up on First Street. So everybody knew me. And I, I, for some reason, I, I, somebody said hello to me. I didn't see them or hear them, and I walked past them. And they were in later on. It got back to me that they were very insulted that I didn't. Oh. What am I, a star? And so I said, No, that's ridiculous. I didn't see. You know what I mean? It's like right, right. Know, it's, it's, it's what I learned about stars. By the way, getting being in the middle of the business and being and being. Um, uh, uh, involved with Robert Keown later on, where I met, got to meet a lot of people. Stars are, it's more, the difference is how people react to them than how they are. Most of them are very regular people. You know, yeah, there are some that are, are affected, no question. But most, I mean, even stars that you would know, that you would see, you know, Ricardo Montalban, for example. I mean, who would ever expect that, that a guy like that was just so, uh, 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 easy to get along with and so courteous and caring about everybody. Right, right. And there are a lot of people in show business like that. You know, show business has a rap of everybody being stuck up. It's not true. It's just, well, I, I think it. most people are just regular people that happen to do that for a living. You know? Right, well, you know, each each store, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of down to earth people. I mean, um, I, I, met, I met very briefly, like five minutes I met uh, Adrian Grenier, you know, Entourage, the, the lead guy in Entourage, yeah. the, the really, he, he's so passionate about the environment. He has an organization he founded called Lonely Whale that helps get plastic out of the ocean. Right. When I met him in Dumbo, because I was visiting, and he talked to me for about five, 10 minutes. He took a selfie. He was the nicest guy. We were talking about the environment. And it was like, this guy was a huge, huge star, big hit, big show. I mean, you know. They are, I mean, it, 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 the, the, you know, people like Tom Hanks or people like, you know, they're, they're just, they have a job, that's their job. They do it well. There's a certain degree of fame that goes with it, but you know, it, it, they're still people, you know, and I right. still, I, I still, you know, and I don't think they go on the subway anymore. You know, it was a wonderful scene out of the, uh -huh. Mr. Rogers movie. Did you see that movie? No. Where he, goes, see, he yeah. goes on the subway and they all start oh. seeing it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Uh, that's the thing that Hanks. happened. Tom Hanks takes the subway when he's in New York, he says. He takes Who? the subway. Tom Hanks. Yeah. He that's takes the subway himself to go to a, you know, if he has a meeting or uh, something. Oh, I, I bet you. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, that. I guess he, you know, he puts, must put a hat on or whatever. I mean, you know, but. You try yeah, to be as regular as you can, but yes, I feel uh, this, I don't know. Go ahead. The, the, the people, the people recognize you uh, as part of the tokens, uh, or what? Uh, Me, no. During the highlight of your career. So during during the time, you know, I mean, if I would be in a town and you know I did a show, people would see me. 
but, but we would recognize me. But generally, I don't. I don't have that, and I'm glad. You know, I I, yeah. I wouldn't want it. You know, I mean, when we do shows, when we did shows, people would want autographs and stuff like that, which we did. You know, I mean, we wouldn't we wouldn't leave the area until everybody got what they you know got an autograph or whatever it is they wanted. You know, I mean, you, you know, we, you, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to stand up in front of an audience and entertain them and know you're entertaining them. It's, you know, it's a gift. Did, did, did um, you have women throwing their hotel keys at you when you're on the road? Um, some. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't overwhelming. It's not like like they they would have done with Frankie Avalon, or who wasn't like that at all. By the way. Um, you know, some of those stars, but, you know, we, we had, a, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, yes, there, it wasn't, it wasn't like it got to in the seventies. Don't forget the sixties were a little calmer, you, yeah, yeah. you know, there were different rules of behavior, different, different ways that people behave, but, um, but yeah, but not, you know, not, not, not enough to, not enough to make you jealous. Oh. <laughs> did, did you did, did, did uh, uh, was booze or uh, 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 not narcotics, but uh, drugs? Uh, were they an issue back then? For me? For, for you or the groups? No. no. Uh, uh, some of the groups got in trouble. Yeah. Some. I mean, it, 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 sometimes you get to a town and the, and the promotion man would offer you hookers or coke. Oh God. And I would say <laughs> no. You know, I wasn't interested. You know, some, not all. This is this is not this is not the usual thing. This this is you're asking me when that happens, and there were occasions where that happened. But um, basically, it was you, you're on the road. You're on the road, especially early in the '60s when we did record hops, where we'd we'd hit a town and do seven record hops in one night. You know, the DJs had record hops where they would they would get paid and have kids come and dance and they would, you know, kids would come and they would call record hops, you know, and uh, the, at the hop, that's Dan, Danny and the juniors said. And, and they would have like, you know, they bring groups in and you do two, three a night. In Chicago, we did seven. Wow. It's, it's traveling in different places in the city, seven record hops in one night. And so you'd go in and you'd, 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 um, you'd now your record, you wouldn't sing live because they wouldn't have a sound system. So they play your record and you lip sync it. You know, that's where lip syncing began, I guess. And and you go and do that and you do, you know, you do Tonight I Fell in Love and you do, you'd leave. You come did, in, you do some more press and you leave. And did, this you do, yeah. did you do mm -hmm. a, a Much TV with the Dick Clark or Ed Sullivan? Yeah, sure. yeah all, all, all the cities had local television shows. California had, uh, all of them had. How about the TV? Nationals? We did uh, Mike Douglas. We did Dick Cavett. Yeah. Oh. We never did. Uh, we never did um, um, uh, Sullivan. We never did a, ma a major show like Sullivan. We we did. You know, we never did. We never did Hoot Nanny or the other one. Uh, but your your office was in the Ed Sullivan building. Yes, that's where my office. My office was in that building. We we're, we're now uh, Colbert is. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, we had a job. We went into the city every day and we, we we wrote songs. We had a staff of writers that wrote. We produced records. You know, it was very serious to us because that would we there wasn't any place to perform at the time, you know, for us. There was no you know, Vegas wasn't using acts like us. It didn't happen until the middle later sixties. So we we had you do these local nightclubs where you dress where the beverages are, you know, you dress in the beverage room where they supply <laughs> sort the beverages, you know, with the with the uh, beer bottle, and um, we once my favorite story about that is we were doing this nightclub in Staten Island, and um, we we're, we're in sharing the dressing room, and and this college girl, very attractive college girl, walks in. She could have been more than I don't know, 19, 20 years old, maybe 21. And she starts getting undressed to dress, to undress. She was a stripper. So we <laughs> went after a stripper. And after that night, I had no 
modesty whatsoever left in my <laughs> If anybody came in my dressing room and I was naked, I wouldn't, you know, I, I mean, if I was in my underwear, I wouldn't care. It's like, right. who was like that was um, um, uh, George Burns. He would right. walk around his dressing room in his shorts. But, but you know, it was, I mean, I, dre I dressed and undressed in, with, a, with a stripper in the room. So, well, you know, that was the end of modesty. Well, you know, when was the last show you did? The last show I did was June of 2000 and let's see. Did you in Beverly Hills? Yeah, in Beverly Hills. 2018, I think, was the last show we did. Were, were, were you, were you, were no, 2019. I'm sorry. The last show we did was 2019 um, yeah. in Beverly Hills. So, so you guys are still active. So it's been a year and a half. What? Yeah. So you well, guys are still active. Well, we would have been uh, probably if we if there was a world, you know. Well, I mean, right who, now, no, no one's going out anywhere, really. Who's part of the tokens now? Well, I, you know, um, there's a, a, a J, J. Leslie and Mike Johnson and Noah. And, Noah's your um, son, right? Yeah, uh, and um, um, we work with a guy named Daniel Carson, I think his last name was. Uh, he, he sang the lead and um, and uh, Neely filled in, my daughter filled in on a couple of shows, you know, after Mitch passed and we had, we had bookings, but no, we didn't have anyone to sing. So Neely, but uh, you know, I mean, we, we can put a group together quick enough if there was work. I don't know, you know, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if there, I mean, if there'll ever be any work. Are, I mean, are, don't you, still, are, are, you, are you still interested in going out on tour? I'm not on tour, but I would do spot jobs sure. here. I, I certainly wouldn't go out of, over a period of time. I don't have the energy for it. I mean, it's it's pretty grueling, you know. I mean, if you're not, you know, yeah, if you if you're somebody that goes around in a bus all the time and you have your own room and you know what I mean, it's a different story. I mean, I don't even like flying to visit people. I hate flying. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I've been a pilot for 50, 60 years. And I hate for you. It's, it's just because... Anyway, guys, our time is up. Oh, how sad. We have to do this again to do part two. I haven't taken, we haven't gotten into into the, the happenings and Tony Orlando and Dawn and... and, okay. and well, 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 I'll, I'll tell you what, since we're doing, <laughs> uh, so since we're doing this up close and personal, maybe we could do this uh, next Wednesday before New Year's. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay with you, Mimsy? Absolutely. Are you there? Yeah, I'm in. Okay, I'm in. guys. Where are we going? I love you. <laughs> Nowhere. Easy, I love you. I love you. I love you. Love you okay. too. To think of stories, and I'll see you next. Well, I'll see you guys before. But uh, okay. Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, we'll do another show. I, on I like you. Showbiz. I like you. I like you too, Malcolm. You only like me. You don't love me. It's, it's we, we love you, to, Malcolm. It's permissible to love men nowadays. Anyway, we guys. Okay. All right. A, a, happy a happy kids, holidays. Yeah, three, three Jewish kids from Brooklyn say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas. Oh, oh, oh. Jingling. <laughs>